Welcome to another episode of In the Box. I'm Daryl Skinner, and I got my partner, Elliot Anderson. Welcome back, me. everyone. Thank you for joining us you today. You know, we've been having some good programs going on, man. We really have. And, you know, I think what has made them really successful is we've had a lot of people willing to come in and be uncomfortable with an yes, uncomfortable yes, conversation. Yes, uncomfortable with us. conversations. In the so box. Totally unscripted, yeah, no doing, prep. Yeah, just exactly. come in, let's have a real talk conversation. People wouldn't believe there was no prep, though, because, uh, again, it is going well. Right, it is. But it's we got a good well. program. You want to introduce our, our folks? Let them introduce themselves. Yeah, we'll let them introduce themselves. Today, we're going to be a continuation of our last episode mm-hmm. for our special, special victims unit. We get a lot of questions about special victims. Yep. Um, you know, we are doing a lot more in the department. The colonel is. Expanding that unit, yep. and we just thought we would continue on it because of the amount of questions it generates. <clears throat> One of the things we do want to make our listeners aware of today is this is a vital topic. We yep. don't want to cause triggers for people's past history, exactly. And we may talk about violent acts during this episode, and it happens quite often when we have citizens that don't really want to call the police because they don't know if we have this type of department, right? Uh, or that we're going to arrest somebody right away, and when we have resources out them for out there for them to contact. Yes. So we want to advise our listeners of that. If it's gonna cause a trigger, we ask that you not listen to this right. episode. Exactly. But if you need those resources, please reach out to us through social media or our website and we will make sure all of your questions or concerns get answered. All right, let's get started. So let's get started with our domestic violence coordinator. Could you introduce yourself? Hello, my name is Tana Mooney, and I am the Domestic Violence Coordinator here at the Police Department. I'm a civilian housed within our Special Victims Unit, and I work with all um, adult domestic violence intimate partner uh, victims, and as well as sexual assault victims. Okay. How long have you been in the department? I've been here 11 and a half years now. Well, wow, that's a long time yeah, doing a good time. much needed work. Yep. And Detective? Hey, how y'all doing? Uh, I'm Detective Frazier. I'm one of our detectives with the Special Victims Unit. Um, we all have unofficial official um, specialties that we do and, and my kind of unofficial specialty is going to be domestic violence awesome awesome how long you been with us uh, i've been in uh, about seven years with the awesome. department okay awesome Let, let's talk let's let's talk about the de- domestics itself uh, why do we need a coordinator for that well the position's been around since i want to say about 1996 oh wow yeah Quite a while. And um, it was initially designed for uh, to help reach out to some of the victims, explain to them services programs and referrals. Um, I review all domestic-related reports every day and reach out to those that... Um, if there even if there hasn't been a, an arrest, then to kind of reach out, let them know where the programs and services are available to them. If there has been an arrest, explain if they've been given an emergency protective order, how to extend that, mm-hmm. what that looks like, what is expected. Um, many times people have a lot of questions: what's going to happen? What does court look like? And so um, I also I review all of those. If there's been anything I thought that you know maybe needs additional services or uh, outreach or law enforcement involvement. Um, <clears throat> then I can bring it to either my sergeant's attention, um, and then that's kind of where Detective Fraser steps in sometimes with some cases that need probably additional additional work, additional help. Okay. So, Fraser, when do you come in? When does the detective come in? So, I mean, essentially what we'll do is we, usually every day we come in, there's a list of cases sure. um, from either the watch sure. command or anybody that says, hey, take a look at this spe- you know, specific of an event. Okay. Um, there's a lot of components to domestic violence in terms of things that we can do after the fact. Obviously, when the patrol comes out there, they have their process for what they do. Uh, for us, sometimes it's more of an advocacy standpoint, kind of reaching out to them, making them feel comfortable, making sure that they have you know any kind of immediate resources that they need. And then there's also certain things in the report, maybe um, requesting certain uh, examinations that can give us different ev- evidence to try and prosecute these cases down the road. Okay. So that's sometimes where, especially if you have a night shift officer, he's getting off duty. There's this like handoff period where we want to make sure that hey, who it, it, you know, having a law enforcement representative like myself, kind of making contact with them, and then we can kind of go in that direction. So it, honestly, it, it really depends on the, each individual case. Okay. But through your expertise and talents, you get together and decide, hey, this is the best practice and best method that we can bring some resolution or guide that person in the right resources without them having to try to do it by themselves. Oh, absolutely. Yeah. Yes. So, Tana, what are our domestic violence numbers looking like for Chesterfield? I know during COVID there was yeah. some concerns in the community about numbers going up, people having an inability to call and receive resources. Has that been the standard here in the county? It's been, um, I would say, during 2020, during the COVID um, 
pandemic, there were an uptick in calls of mm -hmm. service for domestic violence here in Chesterfield County. Mm -hmm. um, now, by definition, domestic violence is family or household members. So right. I mostly work with intimate partner domestic violence. So I don't work with, say, two adult siblings that live in the same home no. and got into an argument. Two 18-year-old so, and 20-year-old brother and sister. Right. Mm -hmm. right. So right. that is tied into all of those domestic numbers. numbers. So to really look mm -hmm. at it and break it down, were domestics up? Absolutely. Mm -hmm. um, our, our arrest numbers looked roughly the same as they did the year prior. So I tend to think that, one, people were home, obviously. Mm -hmm. um, and, you know, so the calls for service, of course, were up. But, um, you know, again, you have to really look at what those numbers are and what they mean, because if it's siblings or you know, anybody who's considered a family or household member. Right. And um, what we're looking at really is, you know, what is it that <clears throat> if this person is in this situation, how to help them understand what that situation situation is and help them either get out or um, try to find a different avenue. Right. And so <clears throat> what we look at is, um, that, well, there's different components, and you have to look at different aspects of, of how that relationship is and, and how dangerous is that relationship to that victim. Um, <clears throat> and many times, sometimes I, I just get phone calls out of the blue from someone. Mm -hmm. And that's, again, um, when officers go out, to a call, they give um, a card of resources to all victims, and my phone number's in there as well as the Commonwealth Attorney, Victim Witness, our Domestic and Sexual Violence Resource Center here in Chesterfield. You know, there's a myriad of numbers on there. And so a lot of times I get phone calls from people based upon that um, and try to guide them in whatever direction I can. Mm -hmm. Now, one of my questions is we quite often in the police department see the back end, the results, yeah, exactly. the negative results of a domestic violence, yeah. that's a bad domestic violence, but there's got to be some early warning signs, some something that a household member or co-worker or someone around that person may be able to see and do some early intervention or try to get some resources. Do you, can you share some of those that Ab you or Nick Absolutely. Um, you know, looking at where these domestic situations start from and you're looking at really domestic violence isn't really about the violence it's about right. power and control yep. right. and it's about one person exerting power and maintaining control over another in an intimate partner relationship and so power and control can look like a lot of different things if you've ever been in a relationship and you realize that you know say one person has control over the finances um that's while it's not a criminal matter it certainly is um can power. be very, it's power, it's, it's power, power over mm -hmm. someone else. So mm -hmm. if you don't have access to finances, mm -hmm. you can't really help yourself if you don't have the ability to pay for even a car, gas, gas phone, right. food, exactly. yeah, that kind of stuff. And so um, some of the challenges, I think, is, is looking at that is while it's not criminal, no one's hurting you per se, mm -hmm. it's still an aspect of power and control. Mm -hmm. And isolation, a lot of times um, our victims become isolated, isolated from their family, friends, uh, a work environment perhaps. Um, and, you know, that's something that is intentional on that offender's part because, again, if nobody sees you or talks to you, they don't really know what's going on in that relationship. Right. So it, it lessens the amount of people that that victim can reach out to. Mm -hmm. So we look at that. You can also look at, um, you know, whether it's an issue of uh, a lot of times these relationships happen pretty quickly. And so they move very quickly and become serious very quickly, moving in together, a, a marriage, a baby. And um, a lot of times that's an aspect of, again, power and control over someone else. When you're married, things change. When you have a child, you are tied to that person. And so um, having a child in common, is there's always going to be that connection with that other parent. Mm -hmm. So, um, you know, you, you have to look at that aspect. There's an issue of... You know, it does if they're married, and is there a religious component, and and do they feel that hey, this isn't something, you know, or we don't divorce in our family? If mm -hmm. you've ever heard something like that, right. um, you know, there's a myriad of reasons why. You know, uh, people always say, well, why why did the, why would you stay in a relationship like that? Well, these relationships don't turn that way overnight. They don't turn toxic overnight, and you know, they start off somewhere good, and somewhere really happy, right. and so that. You know, the the victim is really wanting to get back to that 
happiness, right, that they experienced with that person, and they love that person. Regardless of the things that are going on, they can very much so care for that person. Nick, did you have anything you want to add? Yeah, I mean, I think if you're somebody that you're concerned about in a, in a relationship that you think is toxic or, or potentially violent, you know, the key thing is is that you always have to be able to listen. And if you think something is suspicious or strange, reach out to us. Because I don't think it's a waste of my time to spend 20 minutes talking right. with somebody mm -hmm. if, right. if they're truly in that position. Um, separation is also another key thing. Um, even if you can get somebody away for a day or a night to stay at your house, mm -hmm. talk with them, you'll be surprised what somebody's willing to divulge and give you, hey, this is what's really going on in my house. Mm -hmm. It's that kind of what Tana was saying, the power and control. You need to be very careful about kind of separating those people from that situation, and you're able to get them in a more comfortable, safer environment to come forward with details for the police. I, I know what. Go ahead. Go ahead. Adam. I'm sorry. I know in some cases of domestic violence, most of the public believes that it's physical. Thing. Um, it's normally what we see, what we hear about, but it can also clearly, as you said, Tanner, that it can be financial. But we also know from all of our collective experiences, it could be sexual. Mm -hmm. It could be mm -hmm. any number of things. Um, and I know a lot of the arrests are made, and they feel like, hey, that's going to be the end. But that is not the case in our department. Mm -hmm. um, you know, we do have that follow-up, but I know some acts of violence, we have to follow up immediately, like strangulation. Yes. Mm -hmm. um, how do you typically ha handle something like strangulation? Is Great that Great something question. that the uh, detectives, because that's probably one of the most violent acts that I've seen where both parties are still alive, mm -hmm. um, but it's pretty crazy. Yeah, Detective Rachel and I just attended a, an incredible mm -hmm. five-day training from the Strangulation Institute, and um, that's great. It, it was fantastic. And you know, when you reach the level of strangulation, one of the things that I've learned since I've you know started working at the police department is you know you learn about death and what happens to the body when you die. It's just a, it just is what it is. And so when when a, when the human body when when you pass away, your body releases and it releases fluids. And so when you're strangled and a victim reports that they have involuntary urinated or defecated, they're pretty close to death. Mm. And so that victim needs to be taken to the hospital and seen immediately. Um, even if they haven't gotten to the point where they've involuntarily urinated or defecated on themselves, if they report that they've been strangled, um, there are so many things within the neck, <laughs> your arteries, tendons, um, right. you know, you, it's so delicate that, um, you know, a victim can die within, I believe like 48 hours of strangulation. Mm -hmm. Um, we've had some victims that have had like a carotid dissection where they're bleeding internally and they don't know it. Um, <clears throat> and so if someone has reported that they've been strangled, it's imperative to be seen, but it's imperative to be seen by a forensic nurse. Mm -hmm. Um, and you can have a strangulation forensic exam done at any bond score facility. Um, if you, if you, uh, show up at a Bonds Corps facility, they will get you to a forensic nurse. Right. So here in Chesterfield specifically, they will send one to St. Francis Hospital, mm. I believe the Swift Creek ER um, also, and I think that they have um, Southside Regional. Mm -hmm. uh, they do have forensic nurses that they will um, send there as well to um, give you a strangulation exam. They do uh, touch DNA so that they can swab the neck for touch DNA. They will also do um, a... CT scan, MRI, they, you know, because in order to see those muscles and tendons and veins, it's, it's an extensive exam. Um, so not only is it important that they seek medical treatment, but also not to shower, not to clean up and possibly get rid of any DNA evidence? Well, if they do shower, it's important that they get to the hospital. Right. I, I right. guess, okay. you know, if that happens, it happens. Right. Um, so if there is an immediacy um, of the situation, certainly get get to the hospital right. um but you can certainly be seen the next day or two days or what have you it's important that i guess their health and safety is the most important yeah. thing so and time so is of the essence, right? time is of the essence right. and yeah. and to have a forensic nurse there knowing what they're looking for knowing what type of um you know uh symptoms that 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 person is showing that that patient is showing it's imperative that they get even follow-up treatment as well mm -hmm. um, because they will set up a follow-up appointment they will take additional photos and you know they are forensic nurses and they are used to testifying in court and it, it's just important that they see someone that knows what they're looking at especially with strangulation because right. strangulation is, is deadly and um you know and that's something that we certainly learn so mm -hmm. So, I, again, I, I want to go back to the importance of reporting the incident, the domestic violence. Because, again, what you get citizens today saying, I don't want my spouse 
to go to jail, um, and I remember being a patrol officer back way back then. Mm -hmm. uh, that you, you know, we, we, we pick up the, the aggressor and take that person to jail to separate them from the family. But this is more important now because, again, it can, if it's continuing to happen, um, how do we prevent that? And I think you are talking about some of the resources that are out there for our for our citizens in the county that, again, we're not looking just to arrest a person. We're trying right. to get that person help. Um, can we talk more about that, the resources that are out there uh, for case Daryl and Arlene? You know, we, we're having whatever domestic, but it's not to the point where I want Daryl to go to jail or I want Arlene to go to jail. But I want it to be more, let me get some assistance, that we do assist people mm -hmm. in getting them the resources that they need. Mm -hmm. that, that's important to, I think, our mm -hmm. citizens knowing that you ain't just going to go to jail mm -hmm. all the time. Can we talk a little bit about that more? Absolutely. So, you know, um, there are, we have the Chesterfield Domestic and Sexual Men's Resource Center here in Chesterfield. And so that agency um, does... Uh, court advocacy, so mm -hmm. they do have mm -hmm. two advocates that that assist victims who may want to get a protective order or what have you, and so they and they also have a therapist on staff. And mm -hmm. currently now with COVID, she's doing telehealth, okay. which is very helpful. And so she um, is a clinician specializing in domestic and sexual violence, mm -hmm. um, and she also has a history in um, substance abuse. So many times you see a lot of the crossover. Um, uh, challenges that, that some of our citizens face when they're living in this situation. Mm -hmm. And so um, Kim Mock is the therapist there, and she's fantastic. So they're located right here in Chesterfield. Mm -hmm. And, um, you know, uh, we also work with a lot of other surrounding agencies within, like, the greater Richmond area. So we work with the James House. They're located in um, Prince George, okay. and they work mostly with the southern part of Chesterfield. And we also work with the YWC out of Richmond. And um, there's also EmpowerNet, which is a it's a collaboration of many different agencies that run the uh, Greater Richmond Regional Hotline. And so that kind of covers a, um, it's a whole umbrella of services right. that right. works with like human trafficking and um, uh you know, those suffering from any kind of sexual assault, DV, and um, they do case, you know, safety planning mm -hmm. and case management and stuff like that. So um, we work with them. <clears throat> and that's like an umbrella. Like I said, it's like with Goochland Cares and mm -hmm. Hanover Safe mm -hmm. Place. It's a myriad of places. Mm -hmm. um, we also work with um, Latinos in Virginia, and that is um, Spanish-speaking. And they have actually a wonderful program that works with any – Buddy who is, you know, primary Spanish speaking who has suffered from violence, mm. just violence in general. Okay. And so that's a very helpful program. And um, with our LGBTQ community, I really, I look a lot of times towards our Action Alliance, which is the Virginia Sexual and Domestic Violence Action Alliance. And um, they have a call or text an advocate there. And so also they have Side by Side, which is uh, for youth and young adults. And that's um, mm -hmm. an agency we work with. And then um, sometimes I'll reach out to like Diversity Richmond and stuff. So mm -hmm. it just depends, you know, what in particular that person needs, uh, where they live in the county, because Chesterfield is very vast, right. it's exactly. large. And so um, depending upon where they're at, which agency we would reach out to. Mm -hmm. So there's lots of different resources in the, in the region. Awesome, awesome. Detective, do you want to? No, I, I mean, from my experience, I think that people, a lot of these cases are opened up by concerned family members, concerned friends coming forward. Yeah. And I really can't stress that enough. Uh, my experience, I was a school resource officer before I became a detective. And at our high school, it was not uncommon for kids to come in and talk to me about situations that were going on at home. Right. Um, you know, the strangulation, all, all these other types of crimes, stalking, sexual violence, physical violence. It's, it's not just one of those events happening. Right. It's a consistent period of time. And, it's, and people are affected at different time periods of when they want to come forward <coughs> with that information. So I think that that's why I like what we do here with our department with Tana stepping in because there will be times where people want to talk to Tana right. and not want to talk to me. Right. Or they'll want to talk to me and then you know from there I can get them in touch with Tana. Sure. Um, and we kind of bounce those that, that kind of discussion around and I think that that's very, very important. Right. So anybody listening that's like thinking they're going through that situation, do not feel afraid to come forward. It's This is not you know, 20, 30, 40 years ago in terms right, of, exactly. you know, there should be an embarrassment with that. Yep. And we have a very professional department that's going to know either get me on the phone or get Tan on the phone or get somebody out there um, or your average patrol officer is going to be able to take that report and get us some good information so that we can move forward. Well, so you said a good thing about the school resource officers. The kids see that in their mm -hmm. homes or they may be going through it themselves. Uh -huh. So that's a bridge, again, to connect the, the two. 
um, going into your resource officer, Elliot, and talking to him, and not only community policing, but also those other resources that we have out on the road. Right. But and we're also seeing that, like, we're also seeing that, like, a lot of these discipline issues at school uh, mm -hmm. are direct result of witnessing domestic violence. Wow. It's not just the bad kid sure. that's that's sure. that's causing issues in class. It's that, at least in my experience as an SRO, when I sat down with that bad kid, quote unquote, mm -hmm. he was watching his mom or dad get get assaulted, sure. or brother and sister get assaulted, or, or some violent traumatic event that's going to cause him to act a certain way at school. So those are good indicators for us going mm -hmm. back and investigating. Hey, mm -hmm. there's some other things happening here, and then we right. can get them in touch with resources that are gen you know push more for mm -hmm. juvenile victims. Awesome, so. awesome. I have one question. You know, we um, not exactly on domestic violence, but part of our colonel's initiative has been employee wellness. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And what you all deal with on a daily basis is pretty stressful stuff. It's really deep. It's private. Um, we know that as a special victim detective, Frazier, uh, detective, <laughs> Frazier is unlikely to go and speak oh, to yeah. a recruiter about yeah. this is going on. How do you deal with your own personal wellness? Mm. <laughs> you want to go first? Good question. <laughs> I know you weren't expecting it, but you know, that's, that's no. the purpose. No, no, I, I the purpose is out there for recruiting and we want people right. to know. I mean, this is some serious stuff. Absolutely. Nope. Nobody usually asks us yeah, how we're I, doing. I like that. Um, but what, one of the things that I have to say that this department has done and made a concerted effort in the last couple of years is um, we yearly have to do a check-in with a um, psychologist mm -hmm. and to discuss whatever it is we want to talk about. And um, this psychologist is available to all of us whenever, and um, he is available to us, um, wow. whether it's text, call, email, and, and he responds to us really fast. And so that's something that, um, because again, it's hard. It's really hard some days. And again, I don't investigate these crimes. Right. That's up to the detectives. But you know, you hear a lot. You hear a lot. You're still a part of it, yeah. and it's exhausting. Yeah. Um, and you know, this past year has been a challenge on many levels for many people. Right. And I think that just trying to to maintain health and activity, and just um, you know, trying to figure out how to properly do this, I, it's been you know a challenge, I guess, for all of yeah, us. I, well, Ellie just shocked me with that. You that, did. That's you did. That, that's, that's excellent. <laughs> Um, I, I uh, talking with the department psychologists and counselors and stuff. I mean, I, I in my own personal life, I talk sure. with yep. professionals about yep. my mental health, and I think for me, it's identifying triggers, sure. um, kind of better understanding of my physic, how I physically feel after some of these cases, and with my family, just kind of finding a way for me to kind of have a, a chill down period. Sure. Um, and you know, playing video games, watching watching sports, doing a little bit of things, and setting aside that when I'm not working, I'm not working. Right. And trying to keep that healthy balance. And then, honestly, just not being afraid to tell people, hey, I need to take a break exactly. on this. It, exactly. Or a part of a case that I may need another detective to step in and handle if it's mm -hmm. especially uh, hard for me to deal with. So right. we have a really tight unit, um, and we all work really yes. close like that. So we kind of know each other's triggers and how to bounce that yeah. off. So I, I, yeah. that's, that's, yeah. I'm impressed with you, son. That's well, thank good. you. That's good. Yeah. I'm impressed with them. I'm impressed with the job they do. <laughs> yeah, I, I am too. I but am too. employee wellness is vital. Yeah. I mean, Absolutely we all want to give our most, but at some point we have to realize that potentially could be a breaking point. Sure. And we have to have a life outside of what we do so we can come back fresh and, and, and provide that best service. you got to pour it back in you. I mean, yes. some, you're always Absolutely. giving it out, mm -hmm. but who pours it back yep. into you? Absolutely. So again, I, anything else y'all want to add to it? I mean, this, is, this has been another good... You know, I wanted to kind of throw out there as well um, something in regards to, um, you know, we have, there's always some, a lot of misconceptions in regards to any kind of domestic violence or sexual assault. And one of the things um, I had picked up on something that Detective Fraser had said was, you know, when, when somebody wants to um, maybe report what happened to them, but mm -hmm. they don't, especially in regards to sexual assault, um, just to kind of get rid of some myths, is that sexual assault is usually not reported right away. There's usually a delay. Yep. Victims will delay sometimes days, weeks, months, and years. And so understanding that coming in and, and speaking to a detective um, doesn't mean that they will go forward. You know, that, that person that's reporting that is driving that investigation. Mm -hmm. And so if that person says, I just want to report to you what happened and I don't want it to go any further, that's fine. That's up to them. That's mm -hmm. their decision. People can also get a uh, forensic sexual assault exam without making a report. And that's something that people need to know. Wow. And that's imperative for their health, right? right. Um, and uh, again, sometimes they're just not emotionally prepared to go forward. And that's something Detective Frazier had kind of touched on a little bit as mm -hmm. far as, hey, if, if I want to come in, but I want to talk to somebody that, you know, is going to listen to me. Um, you know, mm -hmm. and, and, and with sexual assault cases, it's very specific that, 
you know, you can come in and, and you can speak to a detective and yeah. and we can just stop, right? And that's fine. That wow. that person is, is driving that investigation. Um, we're here for them. And right. it's important for them to understand that. We're here for them and to provide for them what it is. And we go with their pace and what they're ready to do. Um, now, with domestic violence, it's usually a little different because there's mm -hmm. usually an a more of an uh, imminent risk of some sort that we're looking at right, and, right. and that. But um, just to understand that, again, we, we try to be very cognizant of what they're going through mm -hmm. and, and to be understanding and, and gentle with what their needs are. Okay, so I so. did not know that. Yeah. That's good. Nick, do you have anything you Yeah, want just, to just to end, I mean, you know, not to be intimidating with this, but I mean, you know, domestic violence, especially when it's going up to strangulation, when it's going up to consistent physical violence, that is a big indicator of a potential homicide. Sure. Um, these are to be taken very serious. So if you have a friend or know somebody that has been, you know, choked or strangled, mm -hmm. and you kind of want to brush it off, oh well, that was just a, you know, a, a situation that was a one-time thing. Yeah, it won't happen. That is again. an immediate indicator yeah. of imminent homicidal violence, wow. and that violence. Those people that perpetrate that are more likely to have violent encounters with law enforcement, or more likely to have violent encounters with other people. So, please just think about that. Um, I, again, I don't mind taking 20 minutes out of my day to talk to somebody uh, wow. if, if it could uncover uh, sure. or save somebody's life. So. Amen. Yeah, that's good. Now, hey, partner, another episode. Great, great. Um, another episode that we have done. Awesome. Um, really, really good episode. I think this is the first episode or first topic that we've had back to back topics on the. Because uh, is that set. important? Is that important? Is I know we did important? one on women. Yep. That yep. one was uh, back to back with. Uh, seasoned women and younger women, sure, sure. and now this one. So it's it's that important of a topic that we felt the need to bring this back to our listeners again, and, and showing people what's out there um, for them for help for the from the police department. Yes, uh, we got some excellent experts at what they do, uh, and give you the resources that you need to move forward in your relationship. Uh, so again, partner, I appreciate you. Thank you, sir. Thank Another you. great episode that we thank uh, Chris for being our sound always, engineer again always. today. He, does he always does job. a good job off the mic. And so this is our box. This is what we do. Uh, we love it. Uh, we appreciate you all coming out. Absolutely. And um, again, thank you very much. Is, thank you. you know, we, we're, good, we're trying to improve ourselves on and get into the, the citizens of the county that partnership that we have with them. And uh, this is just more information for them to have. So I really appreciate you all coming out. Thanks, well, thank Appreciate you. It. If you'd like more information, go to our website at chestfulpd.com or you can contact us through any of our social media accounts uh, on domestic violence, sexual assault. We'll be happy to get you that information. Also, if you're interested in applying to be a Chestfield County Police Officer volunteer or police service aide, you can also go to the same website and apply. Oh, yeah. Let us know if you have a question and we will get you taken care of. Good for you. Way to throw that in there. I appreciate that. I like that. <laughs> thank you. Thank you all. You all have a great day. Have a good one.